the session and then come back to the main room when it's done, uh, you can stay in the main room, but I will be in the main room after the last talk for a while uh, to have a conversation with anyone interested about like future directions, suggestions for the next conference, that kind of stuff. So if you'd like, you're welcome to do that either before or after the breakout, entirely up to you. So with that said, it's uh, time for Brig. Uh, thank you, Kelly. I'm, I'm hoping I'm coming through here. Very good, very good. Um, uh, thank you, Sosha, for letting me join you. I'm new here. I should uh, account for myself. I am uh, retired from business. I studied architecture, and now I have a website about panspermia. I titled it Cosmic Ancestry. Let's see if I can show you what it looks like there. Uh, if you go to my website, this is what you see. It's like a, a, a table of contents of a book. Where am I? Oh, okay. Uh, I got interested in panspermia when I read some books by Fred Hoyle and Chandra Wickramasinghe. Uh, those are astronomers in England. Uh, Hoyle is dead now, you've heard of him. Chandra was his student. They were astronomers and Chandra was assigned the project to look for, look at interstellar dust and analyze it. What is the dust? And uh, what they concluded after years was that the very best match of all for the dust was freeze dried bacteria. I know, unbelievable. It, and that uh, is still considered kind of ridiculous. But anyway, that's how they came to panspermia, not from biology, but from astronomy. I began to read their books. I had always been curious about evolution and origin of life, and this seemed like a, a new way to look at it and a promising way. And so that's been my uh, subject for 20 years. Uh, what I, as I mentioned in my uh, paper or in my abstract, the implications of panspermia seem to me even far, more far reaching and deeper than uh, most people realize. And that's kind of the subject of my paper. So let me. Uh, summarize that for you now and then we can have discussion if we if we want uh, i'm going to open the uh, here we go the title of the paper is some things are simply given uh, this is a philosophical truth truth i think there are some things you just have to accept are given and the one that the first one is the uh, the whole universe the fact of physical existence whether the whole universe began in a big bang at a finite time ago, or whether uh, it was it has always existed. Either way, it's not preceded by any prior natural cause. Now you could say God did it, okay, but that's not a natural cause. I'm talking about uh, science and nature, and some things are simply given. The universe is one of them. Now let's think about life. Well, we think life has to have a beginning. Life comes from other life. But we also think there must be a, a first life, a life in the first place. And we used to think it because we didn't, we thought the earth was isolated. Uh, we now think it because we think there was a big bang. Uh, what's really interesting about the big bang is that it's uh, the one thing that Darwinists and creationists agree about. They both like it. Uh, Darwinists like it for reasons I don't understand. Uh, creationists like it because it has religious implications. Uh, people who advocate creationism and intelligent design, I'm not making a distinction right now. But after, the big, after they agree on that, then how does life originate? Well, Darwinists have a series of theories and uh, there's really no consensus whatsoever. And as we continue to learn about biology and molecular biology, the problems for the origin of life seem to get harder and harder. And this difficulty has made it, uh, made panspermia somewhat respectable because if life can come to earth from anywhere in the universe, the chances for life to originate uh, multiply by 20 orders of magnitude or so. So great, now panspermia is recognized as a real possibility, but in my view, and I'm, uh, I'm happy to uh, hear contrary views, even that does not make the math work out. It's just, uh, it looks to me like it's virtually impossible for life to originate. 
But this does not mean that we now have to become creationists. And that's uh, a very false dilemma that uh, we should get exposed. Uh, it's possible that life always originated. I mean, always, always existed. So it never originated. Uh, this would mean there's something wrong with the Big Bang Theory. Yeah, well, there might be something wrong with the Big Bang Theory. And uh, for support, let me offer uh, Jim, James Peebles. James Peebles received the 2019 Nobel Prize for his work in cosmology. He's the most honored, highly honored cosmologist on the planet. And he thinks the Big Bang Theory is flawed. And you can uh, read what he says. Uh, and there are plenty of versions of the expanding universe that don't have a, a, a beginning from nothing. So it's entirely possible that life always existed. Uh, now, now, let's think about evolution. Well, the origin of life has two aspects. One is the chemistry that we've talked about, and the other is the programming. The, the DNA is a series of symbols that have meaning, and the programming also has to be accounted for, and the, and the programming, that issue is not different after the origin of life. It continues to exist as we evolve. And we need, there are new programs for, the, for various features like oxygen metabolism and uh, photosynthesis and long, long list of innovations that have occurred during the evolution of life. These have genetic programs and we believe they existed and got uh, written in the Darwinian manner. But when you look for the evidence, it's, uh, it's thin. Uh, if, if new genetic programs can come in the Darwinian manner, it should be possible to prove it in a closed experiment, but those experiments don't succeed. Uh, next best would be, let's prove it in a computer model because, okay, biology takes time, but computers are fast and computer models don't demonstrate new genetic pro or, or new programs being invented either. So now we can ask just like we did before, uh, maybe the genetic programs don't originate either. Maybe they always existed. And so when, when I say that some things are simply given and I'm saying life is one of them, I mean all of it, not just uh, origin of life originally, but every, every bit of it. So that as we evolve, what we're doing is we're acquiring genetic programs by horizontal gene transfer. And that's one of the basic principles of uh, my version of panspermia is that evolution depends on horizontal gene transfer. And if it does, well, we don't have to explain where this program came from. And someone referred to W4 Doolittle earlier. Doolittle uh, said 20 years ago that most eukaryotic genes seem to have come from nowhere. Now that's a rather striking thing. But anyway, that's, that's the, uh, the thesis that it's all of life and uh, this theory is not even new, or this point of view is not new. In fact, over 100 years ago, uh, William Bateson, who was the president of the British Association for the Advancement of Science, uh, advocated this point of view. And I'm going to read you his words, if I can just come to him. Uh, he, he said, we must begin to seriously consider whether the course of evolution can at all reasonably be represented as an unpacking of an original complex which contained within itself the whole range of diversity which living things present. Uh, of course, back then in 1914, there was no Big Bang and uh, the, the possibility of life from eternity was, was easy to accept. Now, uh, if this theory or this philosophy were accepted, then it would be possible to resolve the conflict between science and religion uh, or Darwinism and creationism, uh, Darwinists or scientists, they can explain everything that happens is into the past as deeply as the evidence reaches with pure science. And the creationists or intelligent design people can say yes, and things that are simply given are given by God. And so we might have peace uh, and uh, happiness and love. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, Nick, you were first. Sorry, I left my hand up. Oh, all right. How about Neil then? 
Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks, Brig. Uh, there was a lot going on there, and um, I'm gonna uh, try to try to narrow it down. So, I agree that there is a a, a big problem um, of explaining the origin of life and the create the what do you call creationist or uh, intelligent design? The idea that God uh, out of nothing created the first life, uh, tinkered with with uh, the elements and made that happen. We don't want that. Uh, uh, but we also don't really have a, a good theory right now of abiogenesis. We don't have good experimental results, at least as far as I understand. Uh, but I think there's a, a, a way to achieve your goal that is uh, uh, not your way. I don't want to reject uh, the Big Bang Theory, which is exceptionally well confirmed empirically. Um, how about this? I've done a survey of cosmologists. I, uh, it's a paper actually in um, uh, theology and science. Uh, I wasn't able to include this result, but I, when I surveyed 126 cosmologists worldwide, uh, a solid majority reported that they think there are infinitely many galaxies. Uh, uh, it was a minority that said finitely many. Uh, given that, why can't the origin of life just be, you know, like the tornado that blows through the automobile parts factory and assembles uh, a, a, an automobile? Uh, that's sort of the mocking example that... Uh, intelligent design theorists use about what the origin of life would be, but uh, why, why can't we have that be the explanation of the origin of life somewhere in the universe? It's just that uh, there are infinitely many places where this extremely unlikely event might have happened. And then, as you said, once uh, the uh, uh, life gets going, uh, it, it could go on from there. And that way, you're appealing not to the infinity of past time, which is your approach, but rather to um, the inf spatial infinity, the uh, infinity of the uh, number of galaxies and stars in the universe. Thank you, Neil. Um, first of all, the, the image is a tornado goes through a junkyard and, and uh, builds a 747. Oh, there are a lot so, of images, yeah. All right, okay. Uh, but, uh, I, uh, yeah, you can have the theory that space is infinite and, and, and so that's uh, adequate. I don't understand how you get infinite galaxies out of a big bang that was a finite time ago, but I don't, I don't need to understand it. You can, yes, have the theory that, okay, okay improbable as it seems, that's, uh, it still happens somewhere. That's, a, that's, a, that's an okay theory. And I don't actually, you said I depend on infinite time. No, I'm saying, uh, I'm not saying that if you go back far enough, it could have originated. I'm saying it could never originate. That's what I'm saying. But I, I, I do also accept your, your theory. That's a, that's, a, that's a valid stance. Yeah, and I, I would just say it's, uh, again, I asked the cosmologists, I, I'd say it's an empirically informed stance, although they admit uh, that it's, it's not settled, but the, the models uh, indicate um, uh, <clears throat> getting the issues of, of the inflationary model, but uh, it, it seems to indicate that it's not finite. Well, if it's not finite. Uh, the, the, the physical universe is, is not finite. Uh, um, and that the, the, the visible universe, what we can see uh, is, is not to be mistaken for the, the whole. Well, I'll, I'll I, I, end, think it, I will end, I will end there. Okay. And I'll just say the big bang theory is in its infancy. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll make a comment and, and ask a question here. I mean, I, I spent my whole life fighting creationists. And so I, I, I don't like the junkyard analogy. I think it's extraordinarily misleading in all kinds of ways. But for, you know, let's set that aside for right now. Let's not worry about the junkyard analogy. Um, I think if, if you're, it sounds like your basic proposal is 
uh, gosh, it seems like we can't really explain the origin of life very well. So, and we can't explain the Big Bang very well. So instead of that, let's just assume that everything always was. I don't see how that alternative is in any way better. First of all, I don't understand that alternative. I don't really know what that means. And secondly, if I'm a scientist, that alternative shuts down any further investigation. Whereas if I view the origin of life as an unsolved mystery, then it's something for me to work on and my graduate students can work on. But if you just tell me life has always been here and that's just the way it is, then I have nothing to say about it. And I think that's not a minor point. Science has to assume that the problems it's interested in are soluble. So I, I guess I'm just sort of interested in your reaction to that. Well, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, the, science, the problems that scientists are interested in are sometimes soluble, but when they, when they say we have to explain the origin of life, they're trying to explain a phenomenon that has never been observed. It's an assumption. <laughs> we assume it happens, but we've never seen it, but it's a very firmly held assumption, but it should be questioned, I think. And, uh, and my point about uh, life always existing, I, I want to go back to some things are simply given. Now, I think we have to admit that the physical world can't be explained by any prior natural cause. It's here, whether it came from a bang or it always existed, either way it's given. And then I'm simply saying, well, there may be other things in that category and life may be one of them. Did I deal with your question? Not really, but I've decided not to <laughs> press on it. Um, does anybody else have a question or a comment they'd like to make? Mm. Sure, I can. Yeah. Is that Carlos? Okay, go ahead, Carlos. Yeah, uh, thanks, Rick. Um, so in your talk, you, talk, you, you describe how um, a lot of genes uh, might come about uh, through plastids or through lateral gene transfer through some various mechanisms. But um, it seems to me like there's the possibility that um, genes can make copies, paralogs, and these copies could evolve uh, over long periods of time to be considered new genes, right? Um, like there's this, there's this constant worry about whether there's ever anything new under the sun or whether it's always just a modification of something else. Um, but I, I think that's a deep philosophical question. Like at, at a certain point, like lots of things are just modifications. Maybe the origin of life was a modification of some prebiotic hypercycles or whatever. Um, but, but just with respect to that, that point of genes in particular, um, it, it doesn't seem to me that mysterious that new genes could evolve from, from old genes, especially if there were duplicate copies not doing anything. Right. Uh Susumu Ono was the first, I think, to suggest that that's where new genes come from by duplication. And uh, now they, they recognize duplication as having two results. One is subfunctionalization, which is when the gene has two original functions and then they come apart and now one gene does one and one gene does the other. The other ph phenomenon is called neo-functionalization. And that's when the gene duplicates and one of them starts doing something totally new. Well, that in order to do that, it's going to have to have a whole lot of programming that it didn't have before. And as they look for that, at least in my reading, and I do read a lot about it, the, they usually don't find good evidence for that process creating new programs. It's, it's almost always sub-functionalization and not neo-functionalization. I mean, it would be hard to find a lot of that evidence, right? There's like an ontological question about what it is that you're tracing um, b back in time. I mean, it, when, when you look at any of these uh, papers trying to infer minimal genes or the nature of the last universal common ancestor, they, they pick out, I don't know, 80, 100 nearly universal genes. But there's way more genes than that. Um, and so they came from somewhere. Right, they didn't. Yes, I agree. They came from somewhere. Yes, indeed. And but when you say it would be hard to see this evidence, yes, that used to be true. But now we have genome sequences coming out uh, every day. The data 
are just so voluminous we can't we can't digest it. So uh, there's evidence now to trace the history of genes. Where did they come from? And what they're finding, very much to their surprise, is that as the data expand, they keep seeing genes they never knew were there. And they keep finding new ones that don't relate to anything they saw before and not, and, and not finding clear paths leading from, as you would say, from duplication from this gene to this gene. They don't find that. All right, well, we're out of time. Uh, so just to reiterate, you got a choice. We're gonna create breakout sessions for everybody you can stay here and talk to me about future directions and all that kind of stuff. You can go to the breakout room and then when you're done, you can leave or you can come back to the main room and join in the conversation about future directions. It's entirely up to you. So uh, who wants to go to a breakout room with Ted? Raise your blue hand. Neil, you got your blue hand up. So there you go. Who wants to go to a Ted breakout room? So Eric and Jim. I guess Ted wants to go to the Ted breakout room. Which room has the bar? Which room has what? Has the bar. I, I don't the know. The drinks. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, okay, who wants to go to Jason Howard's room? The whole conference was an open bar? Oh. Well, yeah, I got an open <laughs> bar right here. You guys are welcome to drink whatever you want to. Um, so Jason needs to go to Jason's room. All right, is there anybody who wants who needs to be assigned to, to a room at this point? I, I see a lot of people are assigning themselves. So, yeah, yeah I'll, let me just comment. I want to go to all the other rooms. I'm sorry, I got to go to my room though. Yeah, I think you go to your room first and see how many people want to want to talk to you and, and deal with that. There you go, Jason. All right. So the people who are remaining. Uh, we can have a conversation about how things went and how you how you want them to go next time, or you can take off. It's entirely up to you. Like I said, I didn't really plan anything for the tail end of the conference. I'm just here. I just like to say that I think you've done a fantastic job, and it's been very enjoyable. Thank you. I think it went well. And 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 I mean, the the difference between working on Zoom here and doing a family Zoom is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is, um, it has been great. Nobody, Thank you. No nobody could get their sound on or you know whatever. Yeah, but this is good. Good, good. So uh, one question. Oh, sorry. Do do you do you want? Are you asking for a, a, the paper of the, the basis of the talk? So, or? so probably this weekend I'll go through and like massage the videos and the chats and all that kind of stuff. And if there's additional material that you would like posted, the PowerPoint, a uh, paper, whatever, just send that to me and I will post it along with everything else. So. All right. I didn't get any takers, I'm back. <laughs> okay. Uh, I had a question just about what is the, when is the next meeting? Is it, or what's uh, the thank you on that? The next meeting will, I mean, assuming that COVID allows this, which looks like a good right. the next meeting will probably be about the same time this one was in 2022. So March of 2022, you know, a year, year and a little bit less away. Yeah, Kelly, you mean to say a, uh, about the same time as the, the conference was supposed to have been this year? Supposed not to have been in March. So March of 2022 at the University of Mississippi in Oxford, um, because Neil's already done a lot of organization, he has a bunch of money. So that's probably what's gonna happen. But we'll send out a call for papers in, you know, I don't know, six months, something like that. Um, but by all means, make suggestions that, you know, now or later on, if you have ideas for sessions or something like that. One thing we haven't done yet is ask people to organize their own sessions. And so that's, that's maybe something we'll do this time, send out a call a little bit earlier and, and have a provision where if someone wants to organize their own session, they're able to do that. You know, Kelly, I was thinking that uh, exactly that, that you might uh, just tell people, hey, if you wanna uh, more the merrier, you know, uh, uh, assemble a group of 
three people to have a, a discussion about X, you know, that, that gets more people here, more people involved and is, is still very stimulating. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's instead of just the, um, the leadership kind of deciding what the panel discussions might be that you open it up a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Neil, what's that background? Well, that's just Annapolis, Maryland, um, where I grew up. Oh, nice. Um, that's not where, that's not Oxford, Mississippi. There are no sailboats in this completely uh, <laughs> landlocked uh, place. So I was trying to estimate how big that lake could be. No, uh, if, uh, if, if I could pick a place to have a conference other than the University of Mississippi and I had no money worries, I would make it be Annapolis. Um, Kelly, another thing, uh, and I'll just float this in front of everybody, but uh, and I'm sorry I missed the, the art, the art um, part this morning, but I've got a colleague who does philosophy of film. Yeah. And I was thinking, uh, is there, you know, if you're gonna bring that aspect of things, might we uh, bring in uh, either estheticians or filmmakers or something like that? There's a very active film scene here in Oxford. Uh, they've got the Oxford Film Fest Festival. Uh, I can see a lot of possibilities there. I, you know, I haven't really thought it through, but is that something that you all think might be worth exploring? I, I don't see why not. I, I would suggest to your friend that maybe this is something that they, they should work on. And if people would like to do that, I, I'm all for it. I, I, I'd kind of, personally, I'd kind of like to have maybe a couple of sessions on art next time. Right. On visual art and one on something else. Um, and where that goes i think just depends on pe what people want to organize yeah, but that, that that would be a way to you know involve other faculty members and departments here that i didn't expect sure. so sure. john are you waiting ne for Neil and Hold on. <laughs> so i just wanted to say kelly and neil can we in if you want to, to some help to co-organize any session about film art i'd be more than happy to i have no memory anymore uh, because of technology, so email me. Email. <laughs> okay, okay. Please send me your email by the chat. I'll, uh, uh, or I think now we have our each other email, right? I think uh, Kelly already shared. I'm, I'm, it's I in the chat you. right now. I just put it in, uh, in the chat right now. Okay, thanks. So um, the first day or two, we talked about integrating um, some of the Zoom aspects right. to the 2022. Um, should we revisit that topic? I, I mean, Kelly, yeah. you can go on on this in a minute, but I think we certainly have the uh, technological capacity here to do it. All the classrooms are, are have been reconfigured because of the coronavirus. They were already pretty well, well set up, but um, uh, I don't think that technologically that would be a problem. And I'm pretty sure we would get all the support we need from the university to do that. Um, I get it would just be a matter of how you fit that into the program and that's Kelly's and right. I, I think the question is what exactly do we want to do um I mean I personally thought that there were some real advantages to this conference but I'll, I'll send out a post-conference survey and we'll see what people say but it, I thought it might be kind of interesting certainly you could get keynoters a lot easier right they don't have to fly from from London uh and secondly some people might want to do certain kinds of discussions or get togethers by Zoom because they wouldn't necessarily have to come back from their hotel room right. wherever it is. And, and so, I, you know, I don't know. It, 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 I'm open to it. Yeah. It, it also might help uh, to, for the keynoters because we might have a little less money to work with since we are spending some money uh, on the technical aspects of our tech support people for this conference. Um, but also, you know, maybe we could get more international participation. I mean, I, I thought the, 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 the fact that Avik was even considering such an incredibly long haul to get over here was amazing. Um, not only is that gonna be, um, I mean, is, might that be intelligent? It might end up being necessary because I, I, although I feel pretty confident at this point that domestic travel in the United States will be cleared up 
by, by spring 2022. I'm not so sure about international travel. I'm sure they're going to try to make it fast. It's probably going to be not the first thing they get to the U.S. government. Well, my concern would be a little bit like into with hybrid teaching that many of us are having to deal with. If you if you say this is a face-to-face -face conference and there will be some virtual elements, that's one right. thing. But if you if you tell people you, you can either show up in person or oh, right. it's right. almost it's impossible to plan because you don't know how many people are going to take hotels. Yeah, all right, good you point. Know. Okay. So, um, I don't, I'm not sure. What, what, uh, part of it was we're just going to have to see how the vaccination thing is. Right. And what, what the trajectory looks like. Um, so we'll wait and see. All right, John, go ahead. Well, I would just say that, um, you know, I teach in a program that has actually tried to do this hybrid thing for a long time, long before COVID. It stinks. Yeah. It just doesn't work. If, if we're going to maintain this portion of it, then we should have two parallel things going on. A right. portion of the conference is done by Zoom and a portion of it is done in person. And there is not an attempt, you might, you might stream the live portion or something like that. Right. But I think the hybrid thing, you know, we did this, I teach in this program called Human Dimensions of Organizations, which is for mid-career professionals who come back to you know, get a master's degree. And we tried early on to do this hybrid and just gave up because it doesn't work. Um, the, the problem is the, the speakers can't pay attention to both the audience in the room and the people who are on, on Zoom or whatever. And so uh, I, I think it might work really well though, if you had kind of parallel sessions where some sessions were done you know, electronically and some were done in person. Um, and I, I think we should think a lot about how to organize that. Um, I thought also thought this went really, really well. And so I think we should try to keep a, a component of the conference done this way. It also allows graduate students to be involved who may have no money at all for travel. Right. Um, and I agree with Neil that the, the outlook, even with the vaccine is unclear. I actually got a, I normally teach in Japan in the summers and I got an email from a uh, you know, colleague over there basically saying, yeah, it's looking like it's gonna be canceled again. Um, and despite the fact that the vaccine is now beginning to roll out. So I think um, having, you know, having awareness of that is probably a good idea and trying to right from now build this to have both components would be a good idea. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, Kelly, hearing these comments, I think maybe, um, maybe the thing to do is, is to focus on uh, the keynote speakers possibly being um, remote uh, and use that to save money. Um, I, I, my plan was I really wanted uh, Shostak here to do a student-oriented event as well. And he was relatively speaking a cheap date, but maybe we get rid of that. Uh, I didn't get much money from the student organization anyway. But uh, you do lose you know, the ability of those people to interact with everybody else in person at the conference. Uh, so you'd have to make a judgment there. Maybe you have one virtual and one live. I, uh, my discussions with um, uh, Simon Conway Morris is he, he, he seems like he is ready to go uh, for the next time. Um, Right. And then we could talk about a ticket from London, which is not yeah, that which which I that's right. We need him to come over. Uh, and and then I was thinking maybe if if uh, Seth wants to come back, that's great. If he doesn't, because he didn't really get back to us about participating in the virtual conference or he didn't contact me about it. I don't know if you heard from him. Uh, maybe Susan Schneider. Yeah. 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 Okay. We can talk about that later, but uh, that might be a better I idea to use you know, Zoom for some high profile people who are keynoters and then have the proles like us all have to be there in person. Uh, John, I also want to add um, behind the scenes, I, I really, I'm patting myself on the shoulder here. I did do a lot of work uh, and we managed to get uh, free housing, uh, free transportation to and from the airport and some money for a flight for every graduate student who needed it. So 
Uh, we ended up not using any of that, but I've got the money for that. Yeah. Would, would you, you offered me a subvention supply? Oh, yeah, that's right that as well. Still, that still be available? Yeah. Great. Actually, that's, a, I don't know how comfortable people will be about uh, letting people share their house in March 2022. That's a good point. I, uh, letting a stranger in your house, that might be different. I'll have to work on that. I'll wait. Yeah, it's it's going to be interesting. And, and to make it just a little bit more complicated, it's not so much March of 2022. Neil and I have to figure this stuff out no later than maybe the end of 2021 because you got to right. give people a heads up. Right. So it'll be it'll be fun. Yeah. <laughs> about yeah. Ten yeah. months or so, we'll be we'll be scrambling. So Kelly, I, it's probably too early uh, for you to answer this question, but um, what is your thinking about where the recordings of our live sessions will be posted? Well, I can tell you what I would like to have happen. I think I think it will. Um, so it's going to take a while to process all the video and, and chunk it out into individual talks and then take right. the transcript and clean it up. Um, but all that's been saved, right? So uh, what we're going to try to do is get Ethan, the guy who's doing the tech support on the back end, he's going to do all that. And we're going to put the, all that together in a conference web page. And then I would like to create a socio organization web page that that's better than the one that we already got and sort of put everything there so that so that when you go there there's an archived version of the 2016 and the 2018 conference and this conference that's that's the idea i'm confident we'll get something for this conference fairly quickly i'm not as confident that it'll all be organized into a social web page real quick but it'll happen eventually so i mean something you know, within a week or two, I think something will be available that has basically everything that happened this week. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's difficult. I mean, with planetary defense, you know, the planetary defense uh, community has biennial meetings um, since the mid to late 1990s. And the records of those meetings are scattered all over different websites, which is ridiculous. And um, I actually, on behalf of the NASA Planetary Defense Program, asked uh, the Aerospace Corporation to look into establishing a unified website. And it never I, I think they just thought it wasn't that important. But yeah, that would be wonderful. Yeah, yeah. But you will put, uh, send us a link uh, where we can find uh, the talks. Yeah, we'll, we'll send out a link as soon as all that's organized. But like I say, it'll probably take a week or so before we okay. really have it Perfect. all. Mm. I'm not, it might take longer than a week. I mean, let's be, this is, uh, <laughs> Christmas is in a week, New Year's. Yeah, it's a uh, weird time to be doing something like yeah, this. And, and, the, and, um, the tech guy got a job, um, Ethan Davis, who you, none of you have seen in this, uh, but uh, is, is working on a political campaign in the U.S., when the Georgia runoffs, which happens beginning of January, so he's going to be oh, wow. for the what? next few weeks. So, um, you know, I, I'm just letting you all know that I, I don't know when it will be. He's a hard worker; he might knock it all out. I don't know. But um, uh, and Adam is here listening. You know, maybe this is work for Adam. I don't know. We can <laughs> all discuss that. But um, I, uh, a week or two seems a bit optimistic. I, but I don't know. Natalie? Yeah, I just wanted to, to join the others and say uh, thank you very much for this conference. And, and uh, I was very happy to, to be here. And thank you very much to, to Kelly and also to Neil and Teresa, uh, who, who uh, uh, indeed had uh, offered her house. So thank you very much. And uh, as a first timer, well, I was uh, accepted for the previous conference also, but then I had a conflict with another conference. But as a first time attender, I. I, I must say, I thought it was very interesting to have these many different perspectives on, on uh, what space travel and space colonization could be and what the societal uh, problems with that are. But I, I must say that there is, a, a, I, I, if somebody were to ask me how was Socia and, and, and what is the identity of that conference, then I, I, I would struggle to, to say that. And so, 
in that regard, I think like as, as if I may, if I give if I may give an advice, I would say that there is a, a bit of an identity problem of, of Socia, I think at it, at this time. And perhaps if if uh, with a future call for conferences, perhaps you could uh, point out the different themes that you want the people to talk about, such as space colonization, ethical issues, uh, uh, scientific ideas on definitions of life. I think you've done that already, but perhaps actually think about making blocks so so you have a, a better identity of what it is that SOCIA stands for and and what it is that you want to, uh, like, you know, where you come from, where you are and where you want to go to, if I, if I may say that. Oh, I, I, I think that's a, it's a good suggestion. I, I'll, I'll just reply by saying that, you know, Socia didn't exist um, really until 2016. And even then it was, it was really just a single conference. So we're trying to build a community and, and in some ways that community is defined negatively. We're all the people who want to work on this stuff who don't fit into the existing structures, right? So I, I really started working on this when I got annoyed with NASA for not really having enough opportunities for people that weren't doing empirical science to talk about this stuff. So I, I, I think you're right. I think we need to move in that direction. On the other hand, if we move too quickly in that direction, what will happen is we'll exclude people. <laughs> and when we're trying to build a community, I don't want to exclude people. As long as the people we're talking about are doing quality work, I'd rather have a very sort of wooly multidisciplinary group that's good than a very tiny group that's only working on one little thing. So I, I, I understand what you're saying. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, 10 years down the road, I would love to be in a position where we have very clear themes and we have a hundred people who want to come to the conference, but we're not there yet, right? It's the same reason I don't have a journal because I don't think we have enough people yet to really make a journal a high quality venture at the moment. Um, I think what also would be good uh, to have a Facebook group. If you open a Facebook group for SS Socia, though you can put all articles there, all lectures, and um, you can announce the conference. Also, and uh, this is easy to handle a Facebook group. Yep. So only to give an idea. Get, once we get the website set up, then the next step is to get a Facebook page set up. But we, okay. we're not there yet. But but we hopefully that'll happen in the next month or two. Mm hmm. Uh, Nick just said something that I can agree with. There, there are some uh, issues with Facebook and a, a big one. Uh, I guess you can just deal with it by handling the settings. But uh, if you want people to be able to leave you messages, then as Nick said, the swamp, right? You, you, you're just going to have to wade through, uh, you know, possibly wade through stuff from crazy people. Uh, but if you uh, close it to just group members, uh, then it's not really serving the function of of, um, of uh, reaching out. I don't know that there's a way around it, but I'm not opposed to Facebook. I just, we should have our eyes open. Nick, uh, oh, Nick, I just see you said, can you amplify on this? A Discord server is a fabulous idea. I used Discord to teach my uh, 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 hybrid classes this semester. So every time I was teaching a live class, I also had uh, earbuds in and I was dictating in a microphone that went out to students who could hear the audio. I think uh, that's just absolutely, that's a great idea, Nick. Don't let us forget that. But Discord is just, for those who don't use it, it's just like the gamers version of Slack, but people, a lot of people who want to discuss controversial things and have gotten booted off uh, mainstream internet platforms have wound up on Discord and on DLive, I might also add. Uh, but yeah, I, 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 like, I like the functionality of Discord better than Slack. And I, I think... Uh, and I think it has a it, it, it's an easy intuitive e interface, at least for me. So I would strongly encourage the group to focus on alt tech so as not to be subject to the dictates of Silicon Valley. Um, well, whether that means discord or some combination of, of several other things, uh, you know, if anyone has time, if anyone wants to volunteer as a social media manager, that is the crucial position in today's world, because that's that's what outrage outreach is. I almost said outrage is. <laughs> that's what outrage is, is social media. <laughs> um, uh, just to, to add on to that, um, I find Discord very intuitive as well. And in fact, I've had a lot of students tell me they concentrate better 
and learn better when they don't have to look at stuff on the screen. Uh, in which case, if you did want to do virtual stuff, uh, you know, you could people could upload their documents in advance. And then you, if you wanted to, you could look at uh, somebody's PowerPoint um, as they talk you through it uh, and kind of bypass. You know, I mean, it's nice to see a nice background picture with some sailboats, but it's not really, not really necessary. Um, well, I'll just I'll say this: I, I I am perfectly willing to do whatever kind of marketing that that we think is going to be effective, whether it's Facebook or Discord right. or whatever else. But I, I think that one of the reasons why this conference went well is because we kept it very simple. Right. Right. Zoom is very simple, and the format here is is relatively idiot resistant. So if someone is proposing, yeah, it worked that, for me. You know, <laughs> someone's proposing that we have a conference where we're using a Discord server, or something like that. My initial reaction is no because I don't understand the technology well enough to really know that it's robust. And the last thing you wanna do is organize a conference, have all these people show up and right. then have all kinds of technical problems that you right. can't troubleshoot. That's, that's basically why I decided YouTube and Zoom. Right. <laughs> Everybody knows those, they're, they're pretty idiot proof. Um, so I don't know, we'll, we'll, we'll have to think these things through carefully later on. One thing I, I did want to put out there, and that a suggestion has come up a couple of times that, you know, since we're only having meetings every other year, again, partly because we're not really big enough to have an annual meeting. But one thing we could do if there's interest is have an off year virtual workshop on yeah. a specific <laughs> topic. You know, if, if people are really interested in Medi or whatever, well, then we could have a workshop in 2021 on Medi that would be smaller and virtual. Uh, that would be fairly easy to set up and fairly easy to run as long as we had a topic that we're confident would get, you know, 15 good people to show up that we could do something like that. So if there's- I some love that idea. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to help make it happen. I just, what I would need is, you know, an idea that you think is going to be popular enough that we could advertise. And then if it is popular, we'll do it. Right. There's no Can reason. I recommend something even lower ceremony to start with, which is just sure. a hosted salon. Announce one person to be in the salon and just have people show up and it'll be like a breakout room and uh, it'll be unstructured. Like this is the case with all the conferences I ever go to is the best stuff is always outside of the sessions. And yeah. so I'm always I am always in favor of, of having less stuff on the schedule and more more planned unstructured time so blocked out in the schedule that hold on my headset is done well as, as kelly knows I'm, I'm really missing the after it's, session it's, uh, arguing over drinks yes right like like so many so many great conversations in hotel bars i've well, had <laughs> well and and like in fact that in, in fact the best one i can remember off the top of my head was at a hotel bar where the head of research at xerox park told me i needed to read bruno sure. latour which was an excellent excellent conversation with long-lasting impact <laughs> You just need to make sure the moderator boots anyone from the chat that doesn't have a drink in their hand visible on their screen <laughs> <laughs> well there's you, sorry, you all don't know it, but um, uh, I was, I put in so much work. I was so excited to have you all have a gastronomical and um, uh, what's the word? Uh, what's the word for a lover of alcohol? Um, anyway. Alcoholic. A lover of wine is a phenologist. <laughs> but, but it depends on which spirit all because they great, have different names. You know, be able to do that in all the great establishments in Oxford, of which there are many. Um, so, uh, if you, uh, Linda, you must come here next time. You will. Oh, I will. You will Absolutely. Love you will love it. I, so, I have a friend, uh, Joanne Gabrinowitz, who's right. an emeritus professor of space law from Old Miss, um, who I will probably stay with there and okay. certainly visit with. Yes. So anyway, but Kelly, in order to run a, a salon, a like symposium, it, it, you know, where the person who's in the salon is, as Eric says, gets to decide the strength of the wine that everyone drinks and the topic of conversation. And then people drink and talk until they get very, very drunk. Uh, that <laughs> sounds like it might be a really interesting. I mean, there's no particular reason why you couldn't do that virtually, right? I mean, you just have to get people who are with oh, I, I have two groups of women friends and we have uh, virtual, we have Zoom happy hours. Uh, one is once a week, one is every other week, but yeah, we're doing it. 
Yeah, I have no Kelly, trouble being virtually you drunk. Drink caffeine. That's fine. You can drink caffeine Kelly, or, the, or whatever. To, to, we had a virtual con- Christmas party <clears throat> with oh, our company. Yeah. To be concrete yeah. about it, you you want for a successful salon, you need exactly two things. You need a host, and you want uh, someone to say something provocative for ten minutes to get the discussion going. Right. Um, yes. So, you know, that's something that you could do quarterly and keep the social connections intact. And uh, just proceed. It's, it's very it's very low effort, which is the thing. Like there's a number of things that people have talked about here. Like I would be willing to give my uh, slightly inflammatory reason about why uh, justifying something from intrinsic value is tantamount to saying fuck you to your correspondent. <laughs> um, which is basically the same attitude I had about any politician that says it's a common sense solution. That's just another kind of fuck you statement. Huh. Right. And I could, I, I could go on about what I mean by that and I'll stop in order to get you to show up to one of these events if that ends up being what we want to do. <laughs> Looks like John has his hand up. John? Oh, well, uh, yeah. Um, actually, I was just going to say that I thought Eric's idea is a great idea and it might actually be better than holding a workshop because it, it's it, we keep doing it over and over. And, and I think one of the things probably many of us experience is that there aren't necessarily too many people in our immediate departments that wanna talk about these topics. There may be a few, yeah. um, but you know, this is a way for us to continue strengthening the community of people that are, are engaged in this um, and even potentially expanding it. But that's, I mean, there aren't, my department, I mean, there, I don't know, there are a couple of people who kind of smile and go, oh, that's interesting. Um, but, you know, there isn't really, I don't have interlocutors to really have a, 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 an engaged conversation with. And so I think, yeah. I think Eric's idea is fantastic. Yeah, I think, I think so. And I, I like the low, the low effort. You know, all you got to do is find someone who's willing to say something really controversial and then just engage with whoever happens to show up. So, yeah. Yeah, and I've participated, um, oh, some years ago in a couple of uh, space policy salons in the DC area, and they were really useful. They were very useful and fun. Oh, one other thing, they should be off the record. No recordings. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. 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 <laughs> I think that's a good, good point. A good point. Good point. Don't yeah. want to post that it, it, it's interesting yeah. how much this is sounding I like. What... All of fines paid. <laughs> uh, it's interesting how much this is sounding like what the the virtual working group that I uh, you know uh, I've been arranging with some folks is sort of oh yes you know, what we had uh, discussed is what we'd like to see you know something off the record not recorded where people are sort of free to to both try out new ideas and give feedback and uh, we've even got some of the organizers here I think Sherry uh, who else is on the line that's one of the organizers I know there was at least one or two other people. Danielle is waving her hand. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. How you doing? <laughs> yeah. 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 I knew you were in there somewhere. I was you know, scanning through the, uh, uh, the images on my screen. Um, and of course, I mean, I, I I was initially curious about whether there could be some official involvement with SOCIA. And at this point, it would have to be a, a decision among both groups, really. But um, my plan there was to have, you know, monthly, every month, hopefully somebody's giving a, a talk about a work in progress that they can get feedback uh, from and, and also, you know, educate the, the rest of the community that shows up about, you know, the, the new research. And, um, you know, if what we really need is more frequent interaction with other specialists and things of that nature, uh, you know, something at, at that rate w- would be helpful. And I, I, I'm just curious as to whether uh, it would be a good idea to try to combine efforts, how, how folks feel about that, uh, both on the social side and I guess those that, that have the, the swig <laughs> uh, pedigree, um, like Sh- Sherry and, and Daniela, what, what would you think about that? I mean, is this something that would be a good official activity of SOCIA or should it be kept separate? I mean, what are our thoughts? Well, well given that neither thing has happened yet, it's sort of hard to know, right? right. <laughs> but um, I, I mean, I, 
I, it, it is sort of a desperation for people to talk to all the, the, the English department doesn't know what I do and the astronomers all think I'm a nutball. So um, even though I try to talk science to them, they're like, yeah, they're, uh, they're uncomfy with the whole thing. Um, but again, right at the moment, um, neither thing is really has started. So it's hard to, it's hard to know. I mean, did we have any, did anyone email you, Jim, with a, a, a question, um, a, 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 sorry, the topics, chat is submissions, talk, topics, yeah, sorry. Yeah, the, I've gotten a few, not a lot, um, and uh, haven't really gotten anyone saying January is great for them, so it's looking like February might be the first go around, but um I've been meaning once once SOSHA ended, I was going to uh, send out another email solicitation for, for talk ideas. So, so there are a few. Um, and Jim, I'm, I'm planning to send you something too as soon as. I'm yeah, and I was going to actually reach out to the other, the SWIG mm -hmm. group to, to share what the submissions were, but. Um, but it, it might turn out that these are happening at different levels. Like my understanding of the SWIG thing is that it's any idea that you have that you're feeling, you know, tentative about, and maybe the the social salon idea is uh, more topic oriented. Let's get together and talk about thing X, or 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 a person who's ready to take on all comers, as opposed to kind of the gentler <laughs> thing that I think Swig is, where you're just kind of go, well, we'll be nice to you. I mean, I think we basically said that in the description. We're really nice. Don't worry. <laughs> And not that social people aren't really nice, but I mean, that's sp the specific intention is that we get people who just want to try out an idea as opposed Sherry, to someone that wants to take on comers. Sherry, a, a proper inflammatory salon doesn't start a, a, a mob action against one person. It starts a brawl <laughs> with 10 parties all fighting each other. <laughs> I, think, I think the simple thing to do would be to start both of them and see how they work. And you know, if it looks like they're both limping along or there would be obvious ways to bring them together, that's fine. But I, I'm with, I'm with uh, Sherry. I think you want the swig thing to develop on its own and you want the social thing to develop on its own. Then you see, you see what's possible rather than trying to, I'm not sure they're quite the same idea. So it's trying mm. to shove yeah. them together. It seems sounds like evolution. Yeah. yeah. What, what, what horizontal transfer evolution we can steal from each other <laughs> what, what i well what i don't want to happen is to, to put lots of time and energy into this only to find that there ends up being too much competition between the two groups in terms of audiences or events or that uh all, all of a sudden now we're we're over inundated with um things related to this uh and so that's something I'm hoping to find out about, you know, pacing for this. Do people show up on a monthly basis? Is that too much? Or is there even more demand for it, ultimately? Because um, it, it sounds so like there's a, it sounds like there's a differentiation and emotional tenor that these things have. And that won't be overburdening anybody. People will choose to participate as they will. And, and as I long think, as your frequency yeah. of the events isn't too large to be self-sustainable independently, I don't think you'll have much of a practical problem. And as long as they're not too long as well, I mean, that can be a factor, right? Um, most people can squeeze in an hour sometime in a month, right? And that's kind of a good, an hour, hour and a half is a good length for um, for many sorts of discussions as well. So. Yeah, because our plan with SWIG is, you know, once a month on, on a Friday, an hour, up to 30 minutes for the talk, the rest Q&A, and maybe it peters out before the hour's over. You never know, but um, you know, I, I would just you know be very interested to, to know if if Socha does you know some more frequent than every other year virtual thing. You know, what's the the pacing there? Uh, I don't think it would be good for both organizations to to be doing things every single month um, because that's really going to you know divide up what people can go to and. Um, you know, I, I'm not committed to, to SWIG being an every single month thing uh, if there's not the, you know, interest for it to happen that frequently. Right. Um, Jim, I ain't doing something every month. So, like, don't, yeah. don't worry about that. <laughs> it's not, it's not going to happen. Okay. Well, and key to success, I think, and is... See how it goes. And key to success, I think, is making it really not very hard. Like, if all you have to do, if all we have to do at SWIG is, like, make a list of people... And then throw a Zoom link, and that's it. If there's, if there's, there's, if we're not going to fuss with any kind of follow up, we we'll just keep it off the record and just do the thing and go. Then um, it it wouldn't have to cost anybody a lot of time and energy, and then we could see what happens. I think the easier it is, the more likely we are to succeed. 
If I may make a suggestion um, from just sort of a technical thing, I, I've been on board with uh, with Discord for a long time. I'm one of those nerdy gamers that uh, jumped aboard it. If you want something that's really kind of low key and low entry, uh, and especially if you're not interested in sort of recording those conversations, Discord may be a good platform for you because it has permanent text chats and then voice channels where you can communicate so that if you have people that want to have sort of ongoing sort of text conversations, they can have that and then you can coordinate events using that as sort of a central hub. My understanding is Slack does the same, but I'm not really familiar with its infrastructure in the same way. But I think that that would really work with the kind of programs that you guys are talking about. And I would be happy to uh, teach you how to do it, Kelly. I actually was the one who taught uh, Neil how to do it, and then <laughs> well, accidentally got Neil, several people. It's got to be pretty easy. <laughs> yeah, got to be easy. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not 100 percent sure that Discord is accessible. I, I'll, I'll look into it because some of those things they're really super. They're really super slick, and they act like they're easy. But then there's uh, sometimes graphics, and sometimes the buttons aren't labeled, and right. weird weird shit happens. So I'd, I'd, we'd have to, I'd have to go to have a check. Okay, good point. Okay, is there anything one, else that people want to talk yeah, about? Yeah, one note on scheduling. If you're serious about having alcohol at the salon, which frankly is probably a good idea, you're going to have to figure out whether to do it in the US evening and exclude Europeans unless they're really dedicated, or do it on a weekend to uh, remove the stigma of day drinking from the American population. <laughs> no problem there for me. I'm going to say it's that stigma was fine. obliterated by the coronavirus, I believe. You know. So <laughs> I'm just saying there's some stuff to consider about when you do it. <laughs> okay. Hi, well. everyone. It has been lovely oh. to see you. Okay. Yeah, it's just a, a noted point is, is it Tomislav Janovic? He didn't. He didn't present. No, he didn't present, but he's right there. He just sat down. So he's he's been available. He's asked a few questions. He didn't present this time around, though. No, all right. No, okay, I, but no video either. No, he's got video. I can see his smiling face right now. No, I think he means <laughs> nothing on YouTube. Oh, no. Yeah, no. that's right. Yeah, no. I just no, want to say on YouTube. Um, uh, thank all of you. I thank all of you for participating. I thought this went really well, especially given the circumstances. And I'm very, very relieved and happy that we got it done and got it over. And now we can look ahead. Um, uh, as I said, I, I regret that the effort that went into organizing things for March 2020 did not come to fruition in March 2020. But it's pretty much all in place. And, and um, I I think I'll, I'll, I'll have to work some more again, but not nearly as much this second time. And I look forward to seeing as many of you as I can um, in a year and a half, I guess, um, if that's not too soon. Um, hopefully it'll happen. So I'm very happy. Well, well thanks thank to you, Kelly. Neil. Thanks so much, Neil, Adam, and yes, Kelly. Yes, thank you, everybody. Thank you. And thanks, everyone. This was this thank was you. Fantastic. All right, all right. Bye, all. Uh, bye. Bye, everybody. Go Thank you so much. Recruit people and email me with any suggestions you have. Will do. Okay. Will do. <laughs> right, well done, Kelly. I'm going to be, I'm, I'm out of here. Bye bye. Right, cool. See you. See you, Neil. Thanks, Thank everybody. You, Neil. Bye, everyone. All right. Thanks. Bye, bye Adam. Thanks. Thanks. And congratulations. Thank you. This is awesome, by the way, Kelly. Seriously. Yeah. Oh. I, I'm I'm glad you you thought so. I, I'll send out a review and see what people thought, but I actually think it went quite well. I I was a, really kind of worried about the technology, but we didn't have any major problems. So yeah, it's not as good as it would have been at Mississippi, but you know, it's not a bad substitute. Yeah, so. I mean, I think uh, he, he, just giving people um, access to to smart people that are paying attention. Um, I'm, it seems like a lot of people watch the videos ahead of time, which was awesome. That was my real worry, is that people yeah. wouldn't do that. But I looked at the download data, and it looked to me like most people watch the videos ahead of time. Sometimes an hour would be ahead of time. But still, <laughs> I mean, because well, yeah, for me, it was only feasible to, to look at them the evening before. And so yeah. there was always a, a sort of disconnect between remembering 
what was said versus coming to that. I mean, um, was that something that other people had mentioned as, you know? I know that one person mentioned that they really like being able to watch it on their own time. I think that was Linda. She said something about maybe taking a bath and watching them. I, I really liked being able to speed them up, you know? So you're watching one that yeah. you're pretty familiar with. And you're like, well, I can watch this at double speed, right? And then when something interesting happens, I'll slow it down. That was kind of nice. Um, and, and what it did in effect is it gave us more time for discussion because we never would have had, what would it have been 35 minute slots for everybody? There's no way we could have done that. So, you know, it, 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 I think in, in some ways it was a good model. So we'll see. Um, in, in the last SOCIA, we ended up having to have multiple rooms because there was just too many people. Um, there's a way in which technology might actually help with that. Like there, there might be, um, like people that get into the main conference and then people that get into the, the technical conference or the zoom conference. Um, yeah, I thought about that. Um, but again, my, my driving principle for this one is I've never done a virtual conference. The, the best practices for that are not clear. And the minute you double it and you have concurrent sessions, you have just doubled the chances of a disaster that will be hard to fix. Like I can only be in one of the tracks and someone else is in a oh, different no you, uh, yeah. no, you did great. I, I, I mean, like um, if Socia keeps uh, growing, the way Ish did, one solution might be technology. I think that's possible. That, that's the kind of thing that might work with the 2022 session. The, it, there are practical problems though, like, like to make the conference work, you need a contract with a hotel and the hotel is gonna wanna know how many rooms will you guarantee? So you, you know, however you set up, you need to be able to tell the hotel, we will definitely have, you know, X number of people in those rooms so if you do a multi-track thing, you got to really think it through to make sure that that's not going to undercut your face-to-face -face attendance. So I think I think there are all kinds of possibilities. Um, and in some ways, like what Natalie suggests, I think is right. It would be nice if we could have a more definite um, set of topics and then people that are really interested in the evolutionary biology stuff can go to that track and the people that are more interested in the ethics can go to that track. But we just don't have the numbers yet. Right, we just don't. So um, that'll have to wait. You know, I, you're you're too young for this, but I went to Ish when it was brand new, and it was it was like this. It was you know 35, 40 people, and they had all concurrent sessions, and like everybody knew each other. That's that's the way it started out. It was like that for a while. Did, did Ish have any you know like gatekeeping issues where you know creationists are sort of trying to crash down and and present weird arguments? I don't think I don't think as much as we do, but the problem with us is that the space stuff attracts some oddballs, right? And so, you know, uh, we didn't have any at the first conference because it was by invitation only. That was right. kind of cheating. And Reno, we had a couple of ufologists. Uh, this time we had a couple of, well, one real dud paper and one questionable paper. Um, that's, it's hard to fix that uh, if you're only gonna use abstracts. Uh, so you could go to a full paper format, but then the, the bar is pretty high and a lot of people won't submit. And then you've got a numbers problem. So yeah, I, I think my, my personal view is as long as it's not too bad, you know, if people go to one or two papers that are kind of weird, it, it's okay. If they go to four or five, or if every time they go, they end up sitting through a UFO paper, that's gonna be a problem. So what I've been doing is sort of compiling a gray list of people who the next time they submit will be subjected to a higher level of scrutiny. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that I would never accept a paper, mm -hmm. but you know, I would, I would wanna make really sure that that paper is not gonna cause a problem. Yeah, cause I was just thinking about, you know, what Natalie was saying on her way out about, you know, what do I tell people about what social is like and, uh, yeah, I, I guess I'm worried that maybe if somebody really focused on, you know, one or two of the the, the bad papers that, you know, they're not going to relay all the, the better things, the good things that, that arise out of this. And, 
Yeah, I, I don't know what, what a good solution to that problem is. I mean, I think yeah, if, if the submissions are judged by abstracts, there's not a lot you can do. Right. Um, but yeah, I just yeah. didn't know what, you know what, what decisions had been made about that sort of thing. I think one of two things will happen with SOCIA, right? Like either we'll continue to grow and in five or eight years or whatever, this will no longer be an issue because we have plenty of people and, and we can do something more like a traditional conference. Or we sort of stagnate and we get to a point where it's just the same 35 people meeting every two years, in which case at some point I will personally pull a plug and say, look, I mean, this is fun, but it's not really going anywhere. It's the same people. So it's an empirical question. Can, can we continue to grow and attract good people? If we can, then you know, all this stuff will eventually go away. Well, I, mean, I guess what, what, what areas uh, of growth do you really wanna to try to, to capitalize on? I mean, people with academic appointments, um, uh, other categories, because uh, I mean, there's a lot of ways to grow, but some of them are going to involve growing the populations that aren't going to actually help the debates move forward, right? Well, I mean, you know, you're you're asking a question. I will give you my personal opinion, but it's not yeah. my organization. It's not like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This group. My personal opinion is that we need to be open to people who are not academics, but we also need to be careful that if we bring someone in who's not an academic they're doing good work in their own field. Like the artists, like, okay, mm -hmm. they may not be academic, but as long as they're doing really interesting art, I couldn't care less. Or a journalist, mm -hmm. or, you know, someone that works as an engineer in the a space industry, that, that's all fine. The question is really, is their work good? That said, it's a whole lot easier to, to know that with academics. <laughs> you know, yeah. like if the person is tenured at a good school and they, they've done this research and then you you know it's a lot easier to assess them and say they're not a nut job. Um, so yeah. it's, it's kind of a balancing act. I've gotten pushback from the non-academics who are like, "This isn't going to become just an academic conference where you guys are just publishing papers and that's all you care about." You know, trying to walk the fine line. Yeah, yeah. Because I know you know TV does it by just requiring papers on submission, uh, and so they can it's look at the whole paper. And that makes part of the other <laughs> I, I, another part of the the conference more difficult to deal with because now you got to look at the papers when you're reviewing and things. You've got to write a paper that doesn't have any venue other than this obscure conference, right? Like TV, yeah. I mean, let's be honest, TVIW is not like a major conference. Um, and the two times I've submitted papers to them, I've gotten burned both times because the papers never appeared anywhere. And so I'm like, well, now I got this paper that was written for this weird audience. I could rewrite it and resubmit it, but fuck that, it's a lot of trouble. So, you know, I've, I've already told the TVIW folks, I'm not submitting any more papers. You know, I might come to your conference, but I'm not gonna go through that again. I got other shit to do. I've got other ways to publish my work. So, you know, I think you can do that if you know you're gonna have 200 people at your conference and 100 of them, or 200 people who wanna come and 100 of them will actually write a paper just for you. But we're nowhere near there right yeah. now. I mean, um, one of the things uh, going back to the audience and growing, um, there's a, like journalism, art, those are all good gatekeeping mechanisms within their own fields, right? The, the worry is when it's, you know, somebody that's, that's coming from a completely unknown background and, and it's hard to tell. Um, one good growth area to try to draw from would be graduate students in um, scientific or other uh, programs, like, uh, what's his name, John Malloy, who's oh, a yeah. Sarah Walker student, Chris, yeah. uh, Ma or sorry, Cole Mathis was a Sarah Walker student. Yep. Um, she's a physicist, but like, if we can keep grabbing those graduate students that have the right kind of um, disposition, grad students only grow, right? Like, Oh, look, I'm, I'm with you. Grad students are, are an obvious uh, place to target. It, it, it does get complicated, right? Because mm -hmm. I have talked to people and, and said, uh, can you come here? And what they'll say is, I'll talk to my advisor. And then they go to the advisor and the advisor says, that's not in the grant. I can't fund it. And the grad students yeah. have any money. So the Mississippi conference, we actually set aside, I mean, it was a good chunk of money. I think it was three or $4,000 to subsidize grad students. But even then there were some, you know, like if you're from Europe, you know, and we give you $500, that's nice, but it's still gonna cost you at least five or $600 just to get here. So we had a system where 
Like we had arranged for people to be able to stay with people for free and yeah. it gets, it gets complicated, but in the long run, I think we want to find a way to get grad students in there. And maybe that's one of the things that we could do with a virtual thing, figure out a virtual way for graduate students to attend so they can be part of the conference, but they don't have to spend all the money to get there and stay in a hotel and everything. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I, but I think we get, if we don't attract graduate students, we, we won't grow very fast because that's, you get the grad student and then the grad student goes back and tells their PI that actually that was a really interesting conference. Maybe you should think about going next time. That's the kind of thing that happens. Yeah. Cool. Uh, uh, I should probably I head on. Oh. Okay, man. Tell us all, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I just want to apologize for canceling in the last moment. I, oh, it's okay. I had some personal issues. Uh, my mother had a stroke and uh, some other things happened too. So uh, I couldn't really focus on on the work. And uh, right. well, I just canceled in the last moment. I thought it would be better to do that. Uh, than to have a lousy paper yeah and, yeah. Uh, yeah well I, I understand I mean we all have a life and it's annoying sometimes but uh, uh, I think you know I, I, it's not a big deal really to have someone cancel but like you say it would be more problematic if you're on the program and then you don't do it or your talk is weird yeah. I was yeah. a little disappointed not to have you though, because I'm like, well, damn it, I wanted to see what Thomas I was going to say this year, but you know that's okay. Yeah. It'll it'll keep until the next one. Okay, uh, I just want to say that this was surprisingly well, uh, not only technically speaking, but also uh, in the matter of quality of papers and uh, and the discussions too. So uh, I think this. This type of conference is worth preserving. I agree. By, by all means, by all means, it, it has some some special flavor. Let's let's put it like that. Yeah. And I think that there are a couple of people that uh, would also uh, would also think the the same about the conference. Yeah. And uh, as to the grad students, I think this is really a good idea. To, to have them, uh, although one would have to find some balance between uh, the number of grad students and, and other presenters. Uh, and as to, uh, you know, you, you said few, uh, that we're still growing and so on, uh, but this is not a bad format, something like 25, 30 people. Uh, I've been to, to this really huge conferences uh, with a right. few, few hundred people also. Uh, so uh, they're, they're too big. There's no way of, uh, well, you, you, can, uh, you can have some good conversation with particular people or even particular groups, but this seems kind of uh, better format for, uh, for the subject we're, we're in. Yeah. I, I like conferences. Um... The, the only problem is if the smallish conference is the same people over and over again, then eventually it becomes sort of inbred. And, yeah. you know, it, it, we're probably going to do this at Mi University of Mississippi next year, uh, mainly because, you know, we've already got the infrastructure and the money and everything. But if people like this conference, I'll send out a survey. If people really like the way this conference went, one possibility is to have SOCIA always do online conferences. It, it's a lot easier to organize. It costs almost yeah. nothing, yeah. right? And it avoids a whole bunch of problems about grad students and, and bringing the Europeans in. And like, it, yeah. it, it's a, I think it could be a really good model for the, you know, for the default. Maybe every now and then we meet in person, but, but most of our meetings are virtual. I, got, I have no problem with that. I actually thought this went really well. I, I kind of liked being able to watch the talks in my own time. Yeah. And you have more time for discussion um, yeah, I would say I think the people Except, that are really committed to this are going to show up to in-person things, even if it is just the same 20, 30 people each time, because then it's a reunion. Um, but when it gets like that, it's problematic. I mean, have you ever been to the contact group in, in California? I mean, they've been doing this for, I don't know, 30 years, but it's really clear when you go out there now, it's, it's gym pass 
and the same people who've shown up every year for 30 years and they complain about not bringing in any new blood and it's like well that's because everybody knows everybody you guys aren't advertising you you know like it's the same old thing and it's 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 almost a little sad <laughs> i think they still enjoy getting together and talking to each other but it's no longer really a venue to exchange radical new ideas it's more like well what is jim talking about this year you know i mean <laughs> is he still talking about why we need astrosociology and not actually doing it well um. that's yeah that's the kind of thing that happened right? um <laughs> All right. Anybody else have a suggestion, comment? I was just sticking around to, to say thanks again, and and yeah, yeah. it was fun. all before too long. Yeah, and, I am uh, absolutely delighted that nothing blew up. So this is always this is always <laughs> the point of the conference I like the best. Like nothing can go wrong now. Like it's yeah, all except good. for the surface of the rock behind you. You know, that's true. Uh, it, it it went much better than my teaching at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I'm out. So take care, all. But All I right, guys, I gotta go support. find another dumpster fire, but uh, I will be back in touch with everybody soon with some surveys and other stuff. And if you have a brilliant idea tomorrow that you forgot to mention, just email me. Cool. Thanks. Right. See you guys. Bye to everybody. Bye bye.